So what we have is, we covered it in the last one, Excel, and the one before that, the web, and I want you to understand that these are like, what they're trying to do is they're trying to show you now how you can use a programming language to get a task done, rather than actually teaching a programming language. So this task happens to be Python, but you'll, none of these concepts are very complex for Python. The book starts off, we don't use classes, right? If you don't know what that is, that's fine. We also didn't use list comprehensions. We have learned just a little bit of one programming language, and now we're going to show you different things we can do with that. And that's really cool because a lot of these things that we're doing are things that you probably encountered at some point. So today we continue in that trend and we're hitting PDFs and Word documents. So what we're going to be doing with those are going to be things like uh, basic manipulations of PDF documents, right? So there's text. Now, before we go into it, there's two different types of PDF documents. There's the one here. Yes, here you go. Here's the best way to think about it. The book doesn't go into a lot of this. There are PDF documents that you can select text on, then there are PDF documents you cannot select text on. So PDF kind of has two modes. One of them is, I put this piece of paper in my scanner and I hit scan to PDF. In that format, the PDF document is essentially a big image. None of what we're going to do today is going to cover how you can use the, that image, right? Because that's a much more complex task and involves recognizing characters and all of that kind of stuff. There's other types of PDFs that you can make with Word, right? Well, some people can make it with Word. I think Word now ships a file like export to PDF option. That's what we're going to be covering today, right? So when we have documents sent to us like that, what can we do with them? How can we help automate that type of process? <clears throat> so some of the things that we can do, right? Let's take a look at it. We're going to skip the introduction to PDF because if you care about the history lesson, go for it. Uh, extracting images and text. So if we look at something like this, we can see Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. This, in this PDF is text. We can see here we have an image. We can see a general format. Here's the cool thing about it. When they write these PDFs underneath the hood of the PDF, this text that's going from bottom to top, right, is written just like any other text on a document. The PDF actually has markup, and when we covered the HTML, we covered some of that markup. We covered what markup is, how markup is different from text. Markup essentially tells your computer how to render that text. It's a display language. So there's an actual display language that's telling it that on the left-hand side right here, we want to render that text from the bottom to the top. So we can ask those types of questions from the PDF, or we can just simply say, I want to grab all of the text. So here's what we're going to do. We have this module called PyPDF2, right? And well, you can download all of that again from this No Starch Automate PDF. But with this module, we can do all of these types of transformations and this type of text extraction that we're doing. You can see here we get how many pages we have. Let's go ahead and pull that down. Let's get their PDF2. Download this PDF from blank and enter the following into the... Where do we download this PDF? Download... There we go. No? Where do we get the board minutes? Did anyone see that? That's a different PDF. Let's take a look at something. Haha. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. <coughs> This must be it right here in meeting minutes. What reads PDFs on OS X? Preview. Okay. Preview. Or preview dot app. I love it. There we go. Okay. So what they're saying here is that all of these these PDFs that we're using, the sample PDFs. These are all under the, uh, the additional on online resources, which I already had downloaded, right? So this is a place where you can actually 
By the way, this is the not good one. If we go to automate the boring stuff, we did this, I think, in the first class. There's a spot to where you can, you can download uh, <coughs> extra stuff. There we go. Download the files using this book. That's where I did it. So I hit this download the file using this book, and then we have the sample PDF that they're using right here. OK? So right off the bat, we're using this import pi PDF2, right? We can tell here that this is a what? This is a class, right? A module. So we're installing this module and we're using this module. And we have this function inside of it called open, right? And we can see what we're doing. This isn't actually inside PyPDF2, right? This is actually just file. So what we're doing is we're opening this, this file here, meetingminutes.pdf2, like we would any other file. We're opening it as a file we want to read. And the B here just means that it's bytes, right? So we're opening the file to read it, and we're sub saying that what's in the file is bytes. This is almost comically loud, isn't it? I don't know. I feel like they should have given us a caveat that that was going to be going on today, too. Yeah. We should, yeah, we need to talk somebody. Yeah. Figure out what they're going to do next week. Okay. Maybe, maybe we'll just cancel the class next week and we'll all come together and hack on projects and we can hit Alibaba up publicly. What if I talk to him? Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe yeah. if he has... Else does he have anything else to do that doesn't involve a hammer? <laughs> Is his job just simply the hammer guy? <laughs> For like an hour, you think? I know. What the well, how long do you think we're going to be, you're going to be talking? <clears throat> an hour? A couple hours. A couple hours would be great, yeah. I mean, I feel like whatever he's doing, there should be a power tool for it, and he should be done already. Yeah? I feel bad for the guy, because I have all the power tools, and someone was like, you're the hammer guy today. Probably got like the hammer guy hat on. There you go, yeah. I'm sure he appreciates the cultural reference while he's busting his ass off hammering on something for some <laughs> capitalist construction company. Slave drivers. Okay, so we have here is uh, we open up this file like any other, and then we're doing as we say here uh, pi PDF two right. This is the name of the module, and we use this thing PDF file reader. Now let's say we download this module right. What are we going to use to download this module? Recap. Pip. Pip. Right. So we want to download a module. We use pip. When we want to see how we use that module, we use help. It's that simple. So I don't yet have this module, I don't think, unless it ships core. I've never processed py PDFs in Python, so this is a first. So let's take it and let's say here pip install uh, user uh, py PDF. Nope, nope, because it's Mac. Pip3, there we go. And now we have py PDF. And I'm going to go down here and I'm going to say uh, Python. Nope. And by the way, I want to see, show you something here. Because I do this really quick, and I want to just make sure everyone understands what, what's happening here. When I say Python, Python comes back and it says, hey, I'm version 2.7.0, whatever, 2.7.10. I am immediately recognizing that as a problem. Because this class, we're teaching Python 3. Python 2 is kind of gone. So when I see this, I immediately flip out, and I say, shit, now i got to get Python 3 on here somewhere. Well, did you guys know that we were up here? Okay, I'm just making sure that we don't have like a board of people like chilling downstairs in the lobby. There's somebody on the couch who knows the Rubik's Cube 10. Yeah, uh -huh. so probably will tell these people. Maybe. Okay. There's someone on the couch that knows the room is 210. Yes. Or, or I tell him the room is 210. I see. Was he like, well, okay, I'll be there? Or was he like, I have no idea why I care? Like maybe he's just <laughs> with the group? Maybe he did, he's doing a splinter group on the couch? And he's teaching something totally different. Has I, he ever should, I should go back down to his class. That's probably, yeah. <laughs> I have competition. So when we see this, Python 2.7, we want to get out of this, right? We want to find Python 3 right away. If you don't know how to get Python 3 up and running, if you can't get out of this Python 2.7 thing, uh, ask someone who understands this a little bit better. Because in different systems, it can be different levels of complexity. In OS X, it's a real pain in the ass. In other systems, it's less of a pain in the ass. But what we're going to do here is simply run Python 3. They already have it installed and it's already set up, and it'll find it. And that'll be plenty good. Someone just texted me. Robert, oh, not with HLog. OK. So uh, what I'm going to do here is now I've already installed pip. We can go import uh, py uh, PDF 
2. No. Hit 3 install pi pdf 2. Three. Import pi pdf2. Help pi pdf2. There we go. I accidentally installed pi pdf1, and I don't think that did anything. I think you just erred and didn't pay attention. So there we go. This is pi pdf2, and this is how it's going to work. Normally, let me show you something else. So far in this class, right, this is probably going to be, like I said, I don't know if this will be the last class, but we're definitely wrapping this thing up because it's just attendance is falling and Parsing PDFs is apparently not as fun as it looks. <laughs> so when you want to know how to do something like this, right? Like let's say you go, okay, we've done PDFs in this class, we've done Word documents in this class, we've done web pages in this class. Let's say something else comes up and someone wants to parse a PowerPoint or something of that sort, right? How would you do something like that? Or they want to parse a different type of format, right? How you would do that is you would actually look it up on what they call the source repository, right? So every different language has a different version of this. And when you pick up a different language, if you ever do, you're going to want to know the name of it. So you simply open up Google, right? And you're going to say here, Python repository. Now you already know it's using pip. And Python tells you I'm too stupid to use it. And it comes up right here at the top, PyPy, the Python package index, right? This is your one-stop shop for looking for Python code. So if you ever forget what it is, and the reason why I didn't just type in PyPy, even though I remembered it, is because it's a really stupid name and it's really easy to forget what that means, right? So every different language has a different stupid name for this thing. Like in Perl, they call it CPAN. That's another one. And if you don't remember that and you ever want to pick up Perl, you just type in Perl repository and it comes up right at the top. You see CPAN. If you want to pick up a different language, Rust has a really stupid one, right? Rust, I think they, well, no. Crates.io, it's actually the fourth list. So if you want to find Rust, it's crates. Uh, all of these different languages provide different things. They're essentially single stop sources for this. With JavaScript, it's NPM. And when we find it, when we land on it, right, you just type in whatever you're looking for, right? So if you want to find something like PowerPoint, you can type in PowerPoint. And it's going to come back, and it's going to tell you that there's a whole bunch of code that someone else has already written about PowerPoint. So when we're doing this, now we're using his PyPDF2 module. This is how you would find that suggestion. You would come here, you would say, shit, I have a massive task to do with PDFs and I don't know how to do it. I'm going to type in PDF right up there. And you're going to see a whole list of stuff right here. Right? All of this stuff is just with PDFs. Now, we don't see PyPDF here. And that's always one of the problems with these things is that there's a lot of different ways to get the job done, right? Despite Python's little uh, thing that there's not. So you may want to check out some of these other ones when you're parsing PDFs or be a little bit more specific. Maybe we can come up here and we can say uh, PDF parser. PDF extractor. Yeah, there's just a bunch of stuff. I don't actually know why this Python is so bad at this. I would expect it to show PyPDF up at the top. Hi, PDF. Oh, there you go. It's there. A pure Python toolkit built as a PDF parser capable of blah, 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 blah. And it links to the home page. And it has the download files, which you can install with pip. Right? So you can click here, and you can actually find the home page of the project. <laughs> Just our luck. Not on this one, guys. No idea what's going on there. But let's see something else here. We did PyPDF2. So we clicked on PyPDF4. Let's do this one. Home page. There we go. Kevin, how come we're, is it on your monitor too where you're rendering off screen like that? Rendering on screen like what? You see how no, we're truncating the left side? Is that? It is. No. Okay. It's not on the right monitor. It's not on the right monitor. It's on this monitor only. Yeah. So that's probably solvable. Who wants to play? It's not, it's not a problem for me, but yeah. I'm just curious. Want to go? Then on the other one picks it up and then it gets really stupid. Uh, you know what that? No, I have no idea. Okay. Okay. Knock yourself out. Look at the other monitor for the time being if you can. 
Okay, so uh, this is just the web page for it. And on that web page, you can find all different stuff. You can see here that this is obviously a very old module. So this one was made in 2005, which is why uh, that you find the, the other thing, why you find PyPy Pi doesn't show this one. So essentially here what we have, I want to recap on this. We went to PyPy, we searched for PDF, we got suggested different modules. I said, shit, why isn't the one we're using on there? The reason why the one we're using on there isn't on PyPy at the top, and it's near the bottom, is because the module is old as hell. So today we're going to be learning how to use this module, and it's been replaced by newer modules. So this is PyPDF2, right? And what they're really up to is like PyPDF4, right, which is over here, and it's just different. So. This one is 2018. And then there's probably others too. So there's your answer to that. Okay, let's come back here. But nonetheless, they're probably all pretty similar. PyPDF2 reader, and we give it the PDF object name, right? So we open up this, which is a file handle to this PDF file. We open it up as read for bytes, and then we get a PDF reader from that, right? So let's come over here. Boy, I've been using Linux a lot lately because this was driving me nuts and I forgot how much it drove me nuts. Okay, PDF object, right? We just opened it up. Now if we look at this, you'll see that this is just here like all other things, right? It says buffered reader, like if we open it up any other type of file. And now we're gonna turn it into a PDF reader. And that's it. Now if we look at the PDF reader, you can see we have that. Let's see if we have any documentation on it. So these are all of the things that we can do with our PDF reader. Now, later on in the class today, we're going to be doing decrypting them. So some PDFs are encrypted, and you can actually decrypt them too with Python. But we can do get, destin de get destination page numbers. We can get document info on it. Right? That may be interesting too. Let's try... Uh, what we got here? PDF num pages, right? PDF reader num pages. Show you something else too. When we have the object, a cool thing about running it inside of Python is that when you have the object, you can actually tab complete on all the methods. So we had this in the last class. It was a recurring theme, slapping on tab, right? We can slap on tab and figure out all of these different things we can get. We can see the theme here: get is encrypted, get num pages, and also all of these down here properties. So I can say something like get pages. Tells us how many pages there are. Well, should anyway. If I can type. Well, maybe not. Maybe it's get num pages. There we go. 19. So that tells us how many pages we have. We can also say something like get is encrypted. That should tell us false. It's not encrypted. Now we have this other method in here, extract text. And this is going to tell us all of the text that we have inside of that PDF. Right? Well, maybe not. What is going on here? Extract text. No idea. This object has no method extract text. Oh, page object, that's the reason. So we, we make an object out of this page. You can see here that each different page has a different object associated with it. So the way this works, we're only able to extract one page of text at a time. So if we take it, we can make a page object out of it. Hit page zero, and now we can do page object that extract text, and we can see it. And that's the same thing the book has. So looking at this, we can see what other things we can do with that page object. We hit page object, and just like we did up here, remember when we wanted to figure out what we could do with PDF reader? We just said PDF reader.get, and I slammed on, slammed on tab, and we can see all these types of things that just popped up. We can do the same thing with page object, right? So page object, slam on tab. And you can see all of the things that you can do with your, your page object, right? So we can say get contents, get object, 
We can say uh, rotate clockwise, we can rotate it, we can scale it. All of these are the types of things we're going to be going over here today. But that's kind of how it works. So we determined here a couple of key factors. We opened up the object that in read mode, right, with the byte flag, RB. Then we took that object that we opened up and we handled it, we gave it off to PDF Reader. PDF Reader gives us back an object that represents the whole document. But the way PDF Reader works, it can't do what we want to do on the whole document. It can only work on one page at a time. So we have to tell PDF Reader that we want to get one page out of that document, right? And after we get one page out of that document and we have a page object, that's when we can really do all of this kind of cool stuff. So that's kind of the process here. And we pretty much do it all, or we could have done it all, without reading any documentation except to know how we create the original PDF reader. So page object dot, what can we do? Let's take it and uh, we could do, there was an info one here. Get info maybe? Get contents. Well, that's interesting, an indirect object content. We can play around with it. Let's see what values does. Aha, so that's for the iteration piece. Page object. Let's see. let's let's save this because I think what we're gonna do is merge these in a little bit. I don't want to break it before we, we play with it. Page object at extract tax, we have the text, right? The total number of pages in the document is stored in the num pages attribute of the PDF reader object. We saw that up in the beginning, that was up here, right? Before we built the object with the zeroth page. And then what we can say here is uh, after we have the page object, we can call extract text. And that's where we get there. Now it says the text extraction isn't perfect. The text Charles E. Chas Romer, president from the PDF, is absent from the string, ex from the string returned by extract, extract text. So let's go up here. What they're trying to show you is that this thing up here, where it says Charles Chas Romer, president, this piece, it was unable to extract that from the first page. And you typically see that when you work with PDFs. The reason for it is because a lot of the documents that create PDFs don't do it right. So a lot of the time they look at that, what you want to do, and they say, this is too complex for us. So rather than doing it the right way, what we're going to do is just generate an image and then throw it inside of the document. right? And then when they do that, anytime you have those images inside of the document, you cannot extract the text. Did you break the screen? You were, yeah. supposed to, you were supposed to fix the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Break it. You you fixed it. it from work. Can it be returned <laughs> to the state it was in before? You fixed it really Because good. that was a lot better. I don't know about that. This is this is a solution fail. You can reset this, but then you go the other way. Well, uh, what do you need? So this okay. thing's gone, huh? I do. Menu? It's plugged in the degree. So he fixed it. Just took the scenic route of getting it done. What was the solution to that? You just let him break it first. That's the solution. <laughs> okay. So let's come down here. And now we've so we've extracted text, right? The next thing we're gonna do is look in decryption. Decryption's not any more complex, right? This is the point of this is that there's just a lot of stuff that this library can do. So you, you get the, this, the page, the same first page, but when you get something that's encrypted, right, if is encrypted is true, what does it do? It errors out. It says file has not been decrypted, right? So now at this point that you get file has not been decrypted, you have to find a way to decrypt it. How do you decrypt it? You call on the PDF reader object the decrypt method. So you say decrypt this PDF file with the password rosebud, right? Then what you can do is create a page object just like you did before, and it works. 
right? That's all there is to it. So there's a special method if you have an encrypted PDF and you can call decrypt on it and decrypt it. Nothing too cool there. Creating the PDFs, uh, you, you can actually do that also with PDF Writer. And how do you do it? You can't create arbitrary PDFs, right? You can create PDFs by using other pages from other PDFs. And this is typical. So creating a PDF, like I said, doing it the right way is a pain in the ass. Essentially, when you do create a PDF the right way, you actually have to do the same type of work you would do if you're creating a web page, right? Creating a web page is a massive amount of work. So what do you do if your library isn't smart enough to do that massive amount of work? You just simply copy and paste HTML, right? That's all that you can do. So this library has the ability to open it up, say this is HTML code and I need to copy it, right? Inside of a PDF file, the code is actually called PostScript, but it works the same way. It's a markup language. So here's what we do. We uh, open one or more existing PDFs into PDF Reader, create a new PDF Reader object, copy the pages from the PDF Reader object into the new PDF Reader object, and finally we use the PDF Reader object to write the output PDF, PDF Writer object to out output the PDF. So we have two objects here for the reader, one for the writer, and then what we're doing is copying from the reader to the writer and using the writer to output the new PDF. Here's how we copy the pages. Just like we did before, we open meeting minutes with the write flag and the byte flag, the read flag and the byte flag, rather. We open the other one again in the same fashion with the read flag and the byte flag. You'll notice both of these are meeting minutes PDFs, right? And then what we're going to be doing is making two PDF readers out of them. Now we make a PDF writer the same way. We just use the PDF Pi PDF2 module. We use the PDF writer constructor rather than the PDF file reader constructor. And we iterate. We say for every page that we have inside of the first PDF document, what we want to do is get a page object, and then we want to write the page into the new PDF. Do the same thing for the second one. Notice how these two pieces of code are the same, right? We could write a loop that does that. If you had a lot of PDFs, let's say you have 10,000 meeting minutes, right? And you want to create a book about all of the meeting minutes you have. You, you would do that with a loop. You wouldn't copy the same thing. But it's the same structure because they're doing the same thing. Again, for page number in the range, create a new page object from that page, write that page object to the new PDF writer, right? Now we have this PDF output file. We do the same thing. We're opening combined minutes as a PDF. Now you'll notice that we had a PDF writer here, but now we don't have a PDF output file. So we have two different components here. We have the PDF reader and writer, which expects a file handle, right? And we have two types of file handles. We have the one for the file we're writing to and the ones from the files we're reading from. So if you come up here, you see we open these two files with the open. There's nothing PDF-y about it. This could be called apples, this could be called oranges. They don't have to have PDF anywhere. We're just opening files. But we don't have one to save the file. So we got the two we're reading from, we don't have the one to save it. We come down here, here's the one we're saving to. Right? We create a PDF writer with that handle that we're saving to. And we write to it. We, when we write to it, we, we use the PDF writers method, right? and we give that file handle, that file object, to the write method. So we have read object, the read file object one, read file object two. We have write file object one. We give it to the PDF output, PDF writer, write, and then the write file object. Then we close the write file, close the two read files, and we're done. So if we look here, we, we're, we're done with that whole task, right? There's nothing more to it. And I'm, this is just another way of explaining it, the com creating the combined minutes, right? Mm -hmm. That's this guy right here. One of the things about most PDF readers is that they cannot add pages to the middle, right? So you essentially build up a new PDF by looking at all of the things in your old PDF, inserting something new, and then inserting all of the things that came after it. That's how you add something to the middle. So rather than saying, put this here in the middle, you say, copy everything in the beginning, then copy this thing I've given it, then copy the end. It's another way of doing it, right? So that's all that we do here. 
So we ro we're rotating a page, and we're rotating a page that's not in the beginning. I believe that's the task. I'm getting minutes two into a single document, remember? Maybe not yet. So how do we rotate a page? We do the same thing we did just did, right? The only difference that's different is now we're going to use rotate clockwise and rotate clock counterclockwise. And these are methods on the page object, right? So we have here minutes file. We give it a minutes file, meeting minutes.pdf. All of that's the same. Here we have page. We say get page zero. This is the same. This time, rather than just getting the page, we say page.rotate clockwise 90. Now you've got a rotated page, right? And then all of the writing is the same. There's nothing different about it. Really, the only thing they're saying here is if you want to rotate a page, you can call this rotate clockwise thing and you get your page rotated. So if we see here up at the top, let me show you the orientation of the page. We have this black bar on the left and we can read it like this, but we can rotate the page so this is horizontal and that's what we do. Now the page is rotated and the black bar is horizontal and all of this crap is wrong. Is it okay if we put pieces over there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this no, is the only... it's not. <laughs> well, we could just say put the pizzas here and take that pineapple crap back. <laughs> Do you eat pineapple pizza? Uh, no. He's a good man. I like that. What's your name? We're going to request you next time specially. <laughs> no. This is actually... <laughs> this, we, we call this group pizza and humans against pineapple pizza? When you ever go to deliver pizza and you just have a pineapple pizza in hand and you know who actually ordered it and that they like it, do you ever like look at them like, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> I'm pretty sure Domino's has a no judgment policy. <laughs> you can never reserve moral judgment when facing a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Mounting extremism. Quick run. Have you raised your tip just because you're so open for pineapple? Should give them a huge tip. It's company money. They haven't let sign. They haven't. They don't let me sign checks yet. When they do. What? I do now. Yeah, they've absorbed me. All right. So good news is we're almost halfway through. We're almost 40 minutes into it. So I think we're going to get done a little bit earlier today. OK, PyPDF2. So what we do now is we, we're essentially we're changing it up now. We're overlaying pages. What does overlaying mean? By the way, this has made me money before. So processing PDFs, this may be one to keep attention to. I'll actually tell you where I made money from it. And then you can all go look and see whether or not you can make money with it too. There is something called the Harris County District Clerk, right? <laughs> I'm about to tell you how I fucked them. No. <laughs> what do you want to know? Just there yesterday. What's up? No, so no. if you go to the Harris County District Clerk, right, yeah. and you log in, and you download their, they have they have a subscriber plan. The subscriber plan allows you to download, and uh, and then with the subscriber plan, they bill you, right? So you pay like a dollar a page with the subscriber plan, and then. You know, however many PDFs the attorneys download, if they download like a 100 page PDF, they essentially send the clerk's office a $100 bill and they add it to their tab for the, the, the subscriber plan. That's, that's how it used to work anyway. They may have changed it. But before you download and you decide what you want to pay for, you can preview. And if you preview the document, <laughs> there's a big watermark right down the center of it that says not for official use, right? So when in 2006, I was sued. And when I was sued, I didn't have access to the subscriber plan. So when they send you your court documents, they, they, they have to go through and essentially, they send them all to you by mail, right? And I'd missed a couple of copies of them. They just never got it to me. The whole thing's a pain in the ass. The digital method with PDFs is a ton easier. But when you get the digital method with PDFs, they always, you know, they had that watermark there. Well, that watermark is actually vulnerable to the same thing. They combined it against the original PDF, and just like you combine it with the original PDF, you can strip it away from the original PDF. So I would take all of the things that they sent me, strip away this combined, uh, this, you know, not for uh, whatever, what does it say? I forget what it says. The what the hell the watermark says. It's like, uh, 
uh, not for official use or something like that. Strip it away, and I would file them right back with the court whenever I needed to file something like in response to it. Uh, yeah, so that's how I saved two dollars a page, and then I sold that to attorneys. <laughs> So they were all filing documents that were essentially just stripped out copies. So now we're going to see how we make them. And this is how they made them. And the, the problem is that this is not secure at all, right? So, but everyone thinks it's secure. So you can, you can take it and you can say here, uh, they're, they're taking the PDF minutes file and they're taking the PDF watermark, right? And they say here, PDF reader, get page zero, right? That's going to be getting the minutes first page. Now they have this watermark reader and they're doing the same thing. PDF2, PDF file reader, the same thing that they did right up here, right? And here you'll notice the syntax is slightly different. So let's cover it. Up here, we open the file. We get ourselves a file object. Now in this class, I've been using two things interchangeably because in Python, they just say object for everything until they're blue in the face, which is fine. This is a file object. In other languages, they'll call this a file handle. If you see file handle or file object, that's fine. In Python, everything is an object. But in other languages where they're not, it's a handle. So we get ourselves the object here, this file object, by calling this open method. And then we simply provide this to PyPDF reader. Now, for those that are attentive, they'll sit there and go, OK, well, what the hell is minutes file good for if the only thing I'm ever doing is giving it to this function, PDF file reader? Right? What am I ever going to use minutes file for again? You don't use it again. The next time you see it is down here when you close it. This is a common thing. Some people don't like this. Some people call it an anti-pattern. How do you get rid of that? How do you get rid of creating this minutes file? Well, you can do that simply by wrapping them all in one function. Right, so now we have PDF2, PDF reader, right? And we're just simply providing it open, right? But this is no different. It's just not assigned to a variable name. So we don't have a wasted variable minutes file anywhere, right? That's all there is to it. They copied the whole thing here. And well, they copied the whole thing here and they simply put it right here. Okay, so we do. We but will it be closed in the problem? Yes, in Python. It's a good point. Maybe not in other languages, but we're not going to do that. So that's it. That's another really good point, too. We could talk about this. These closes down here are not at all required, right? They are only required in very limited in very special circumstances, none of which this should encounter. So you don't actually need them. Because when you're done with the files, like in this script, and the program closes, those file handles are freed back to the operating system. So there's no real point. The buffers are closed, the file is done, all of that stuff happens automatically. When you run a program for a long time, it's good to get in the habit of doing it right. And doing it right means closing the files, right? So. It's not required here because this is literally all we're doing. But if you write 10,000 lines of Python and you're touching hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of files, it's probably a good idea to clean up after yourself. Make sense? OK. But yes, to answer the question, if you put it in the middle of the, the call, they get closed right after because it goes out of scope. That's how that works. Uh, minutes first page. Here what we do is we call mer page merge, merge page, right? And what we're doing here is we're merging the minutes page with the shitty watermark. And then what we do here is we create another PDF writer just like we did in the top. We add the page to it just like we did in the top. But now what we're doing is we're adding the page that is a result of the merge. So the merge page on minutes first page, right? <coughs> Let's take a look at this context here. And I want to show you something different. Let's look at this. Let's look at this line right here, right? Look at this closely and look at this line right above it, right? There's something kind of subtle in this. I want, I want you to see this. We say PDF watermark reader equals pi PDF PDF file reader. And then here we say minutes first page dot merge page. Anyone but Robert, because he already sees it, tell me what's the difference between these two. Anyone see anything subtle? OK, this is something you should always be thinking about when you're reading a program or when you're writing your own. And the one above, we have this thing, PDF file reader, right? We're creating something new. We're creating something new. 
We're creating something new and we're assigning it to this variable, PDF watermark reader. In the one below, we're not creating anything new. So what does that mean? It means we're mutating something that we've already created. So what's the implication there? The implication here is that this will not break any shit anywhere else in your program and you don't have to worry about it because we're assigning an operation to a new variable. But the one below it, minutes first page dot merge page, this is going to screw up anyone who wanted the first page without your watermark, right? So you have to be cognizant about two different ways you can write this. And when you're creating the library, this is really, this can be confusing, right? Because you're going to have some libraries that do things that change what you're working <coughs> with and some things that they create totally new. And if you remember, we saw this earlier on because we saw that we can call list.sort, right? And then that actually changes the list. If I say here A equals, uh, well, let's show off age, 90210, boom, right? I can call a.sort, and now what happens to A? It's different. The elements are all different, right? But if I go up again and I assign the same things to it, I can call uh, list dot sort A, right? Now if I look at A, they're still sorted. I thought the whole, oh, wait a second. A equals 90210, dun dun dun, list dot sorted. Was that the thing? There is a non-destructive sort operation, and I forgot what it was. I could have sworn it was like sorted. I, I think it's a sorted function. Aha, there we go. That's exactly right. Okay. So let's watch that. Let's go back Ooh. over here. I'm gonna walk over to this one. When we did this, we said here A, and I had, I said 90210, and I said a.sort, right? And then I looked at A, and it changed. I reset it, and I verified that it was reset. And then what I did is I called down here list.sort A, right? And I looked at A, and it changed. So I can see here list.sort A and a.sort, they're the same thing. And both of these, when you give it a variable A, it changes that variable. It's never the same. It's in a different order. But Python provides a, uh, a function called sort it. And if you give the variable to sort it, it sorts it, right? But it doesn't change it, it returns it. So when I said sorted A, here's the sorted copy. I didn't assign this anywhere, but it's right here. Well, when I look at A, it still has the original order, right? So that's, that's exactly what I wanted to show with this, that those subtleties, if you're not paying attention, can come up and bite you. When we call minutes first page dot merge page, we're doing the same thing. We are changing minutes first page, okay? And then there's nothing else special about it, right? We have a first page, the first page has the watermark. What we're doing is we write the first page and then we write every other page. So in this one, they're nicer than the Harris County District Clerk. They only watermark the first page. The district clerk watermarks every page. Okay. So there you go. Now we have the, the first page, and then we have uh, the watermark, and now we have the watermark on the first page where it says top secret. Right? Cool. Encrypting PDFs, we will cover that after we eat pizza, unless you like pineapple pizza, in which case, just wait around and start. Previously in the last class, in the last, before we went and broke for lunch, we did, uh, we did decrypting PDFs. Encrypting PDFs, essentially more of the same shit. So when we encrypt a PDF, we do the same thing. We're getting the PDF writer object, the PDF reader object. Remember, both of these take a file, well, the reader takes a file object. So we went through it. Here we're creating a file object with open. We provide that file object, a PDF file reader, we get a PDF reader object. We build our own PDF writer object, we iterate through the pages. What are we doing differently this time? Well, here, when we add to the PDF writer all these different unique pages, we call afterward PDF writer.encrypt. And that one line is all that we've done differently. That line's going to encrypt it, and then when we actually want to create the file in which we're writing, which is what we're doing right here, we open up a new file, and we say write as bytes, 
we give that new file right to the uh, PDF writer dot write method. Now result PDF right gets written to with this new object that has encryption built into it. So PDF writer dot encrypt tells PDF writer that next time you want to write to me, you want to write something, you give me a file handle, you give me a file object, I will write something encrypted instead. So we just talked about what it means to mutate and change that state, right? We'd use the list as an example. When we call PDF writer dot encrypt, we forever change PDF writer to be something that works with encryption. So anyone else who is using that PDF writer and didn't want to write encrypted PDFs should notify them or make your own. Okay, so in this one we're gonna we're gonna do a lot of things. Find all PDF files, sort the file names so the PDFs are added in order, write each page excluding the first page of each PDF to the output file, <coughs> call os.lister to find all files in the current working directory and remove all non-PDF files, right? So essentially what we're doing is we are we are adding all non-PDF files in the current working directory. I don't know why we're doing that again here though. Find all PDF files in the current working directory, sort through the PDFs to make them in order, write each page excluding the first page of each PDF file. Oh, okay, this is what I missed in terms of implementation. Okay. So that's a really bad formatting for HTML. That's not how lists are supposed to work. Find all pages in the current working directory, sort the pages, and write them all out, right? So we're just writing all of the, the pages in the current working directory. This list below is just giving us more detail about what we're doing. They're giving us hints here. Call os.lister. Remember, we used os before. We also used shutil. os gives us an interface to the operating system. That's where all the operating system stuff is. There's os.sys, which we use quite frequently, right? You guys remember that one? And then we have os.lister, which gives us the result of everything in there. And then there was shutil. We use that in the same class. We're removing files. So we call os.lister, get all the files in the directory. Then we call python sort, and we showed you that previously, mucking around, had nothing to do with the class, to alphabetize the file names. <coughs> then we're going to create a PDF writer object for the output PDF and loop over each PDF file creating a PDF reader object for it. And we're simply going to then, with that reader object, get all of the pages and add the pages to the output PDF and write the output PDF to a file. Okay. So step one, find all PDF files. This is going to be the os.lister stuff. That's right here. So we've seen that before. We've used that exact line in a prior chapter. We simply, how do we find out if a file is a PDF file? i give you a hint. This isn't the right way to do it, but this way it works. So a PDF file can have any extension, right? You shouldn't make the assumption that a PDF file has the .pdf extension. So, but that's what we're doing here. So we say if the, and it's actually convenient because then I don't have to go into more complexity and we can just skip that. This is the Windows way of doing something. You put an extension at the end and it tells you what's inside of it and half of the time it's right. So the file name here is going to be .pdf. We simply see whether or not whatever we find in that directory ends with .pdf. If it is, we assume it's a PDF, right? Uh, what's up? The better way is to see if it, the file itself matches the percent PDF string. Or an even better way is just to assume the user called you correctly. No. Anything that the user gave you but we're looking for all the things in the current directory that are PDFs. Yeah. That's a missed feature. There you go. I like to make my users do lots of work, and if they screw it up, I just delete their computer. <laughs> so what we do is, uh, if you end in a PDF, we add the PDF to uh, this PDF files list up at the top, right? Then we sort that list. We can see here something new. Key equals string dot lower. Why are we doing this? Well, because if we don't use this, key equals string dot lower, then we sort files where all of the lower level letter files come before the upper letter files. I mean, all of the upper letter files come before all the lower level letter files. So that means that uh, capital uh, Z comes before lowercase a, and that's stupid. But that's the way that it will work otherwise. So that's what this key equals string dot lower does. 
Moving on, we create a PDF writer object. How do we do that? The same way we've done it the last five million times, we just call the same thing here, PDF2, PDF file writer. Now, you'll notice it doesn't take anything. Explaining that a little bit more, it doesn't take anything because you don't have to provide it an object to start writing, right? When you use the PDF reader, you provide it a file object because that reader is intrinsically tied to that object you're writing. But the writer doesn't, right? So you take the writer, you assemble this PDF document internally, and then you call writer.write and you give it the file you want to write to. So the, the, just the flow is backwards. After the shebang long, and the, 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 by the way, we had, a, we had a history last year one time about the, the shebang line or the shebang or, I forget who, was that you? What was the reason for it? That was my bang and my question mark. Hash. Hash. Hash bang. Shebang. Hash. Yeah. Which is now the number sign or the pound sign. Really? More it's kind of interesting because the loader has special codes put directly in there to look for the shebang. Yep. So the kernel. Or hashtag. There you go. Music's now written in the hashtag. F hashtag, there you go. Okay, after the shebang line and the descriptive comments about what the program does, the code imports the OS and PyPDF2 mod modules. The OS.lister is, we already know all that crap. Let's just skip it. Right, OS.lister finds all the files. We've seen it a thousand times. One each PDF. Open each PDF. Okay, look here. When we loop through all these files, we're going to create the PDF file object, right? That's right here. This is I don't like this, and I'll tell you why I don't like this. I don't like this because when they say PDF file object, that's stupid. It's just a file object. It's not a PDF file object, right? The reason why that's confusing is you will open all files using open. You will provide different modes, which are these things right here. There are read modes, there are write modes, and then there's the special B, which means bytes. There's nothing about this that is PDF-y, right? It's only a PDF file object because you're hoping file name is a PDF. But it may not be, because you could store an mp3 as .pdf, and then it would just be a file object, and my name would be right. <coughs> but either way, the program is going to die. So the point is that I like to distinguish this PDF reader object. This is doing something that is specific to just PDFs. It is a PDF reader. This open here could be anything, right? So it's just a file object. So we get a file object, and then we provide it to the reader here, PDF file reader. We construct a reader with our file object, right? So that's how we do it. Now we have to add each page. How do we do that? Well, we go one step further. We have PDF reader.numpages. PDF reader.numpages is going to return the amount of pages in here. So we say four page in range, one till the end. Now, one here, is this required? Dun 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 da da dun 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 Why is it required? Because PDF num pages is going to tell you the amount of pages that you have, and it's going to start from one. That's why that's required. So PDF num pages right here, starting from one. So range must also start from one. Okay. So if I take it right over here and we say range 110, 1, 5, more realistic. Well, let's do it like this, list, so we can actually see it. We have one, two, three, four, right? That's what we want to happen over here when we say range one. If we don't have that one, what happens? You get zero through four, which is the same as this. So notice that if I don't provide the first argument, it works the same way, as long as that first argument is zero. We're trying to change it because we want it to be one, which ships all of the numbers over one, right? And you drop one. So now rather than having five numbers, zero through four, you have one through four. So this is actually confusing a little bit. So if num pages, for example, is five, as you just illustrated, then you get one through four. Loop through all of the pages, except the first, and add them. These. Left trying to skip one page. He's trying to skip one page. Yeah. And that's the reason why you need to start with an offset. What about the last page? 
you're getting the last page. You're not getting the first page, so you're starting with an offset. If you want the first page, you would have zero comma PDF reader num pages or simply PDF reader num pages. But what you're doing is you're looping through all pages except the first. How do you skip the first page? Don't start at zero, start at one. Do we follow? Yeah, it's counting pages, the first page is zero. Yes, yes. Because it's still an index. It's so just one here means the second page. Exactly. One means the second page, that's right. Not one page. Yes, if I said that, that's wrong. Yes, that's right. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Save the resulting PDF to a, a file. The code inside the for loop copies each page object individually to the PDF writer object. Now remember, copying it to the PDF writer object it doesn't flush it to the disk, which means that with this library, every page you add to the PDF writer object is going to make your program take slightly more space. So if you add 10 million pages, you should expect your computer to run out of memory. Likely, I don't know. Now today's computers have a lot of pages, but 10 million would be a cry. Uh, so these are all things to think about, you know? Remember, you want to skip the first page. Since PDF considers zero to be the first page, your loop should start at one and then go up, but not include the integer.pdf reader num pages. Why do we skip the first page? We skip the first page because, I think they set it up here. Dun, dun, dun. Combining select pages, yes, each here. Each of them has a cover sheet as the first page. Yep. So they didn't actually say that. They say in terms of implementation, your code will need to do, and then they totally left that out of the hole in terms of implementation, but it is in the text. Okay, so that's what we're doing. At each page, and then saving the results, very simple. So now we have a PDF writer, and it has all of this stuff saved to it. It's getting kind of big. Time to let it go. How do we let it go? We create a output file. Again, it says PDF output, nothing special about it. It's just the file that you're going to write to with bytes, WB. PDF writer write PDF output. PDF writer is this thing we built up right here. PDF output is the regular file. PDF writer write output. PDF output .close. we're done. Now they give you some ideas for similar programs. Cut out specific pages from PDFs, reorder pages in PDFs, create a PDF from only those pages that have specific input identified by extract text. Okay. <coughs> so moving on, Word documents. <coughs> now for those of you that don't know, Word documents, they used to be what they call binary files, right? And a binary file is like an executable. It has inside of it a lot of data in a format that is not text, which is really the takeaway. Now when you open up these docx things though, right, docx under the hood is just the zip of XML. And it can be kind of cool to do that. If someone ever sends you a docx file, rename it to .zip and just open it. Double click it. And you can open it and see a bunch of files inside of it. Some of those files are going to be XML, some of them will be CSS with all your styling stuff. And you can actually see what's inside of that file and take it apart. Okay. So what you're doing here is we're going to use a module to work with this docx format. So how do we do it? We are going to install something called docx, right? But we're, we're importing uh, python-docx. No, no. The installation name docx is for a different module that this book does not cover. However, you're going to import the python-docx module. You'll need to run import docx, not python. Okay. So <coughs> I'm going to read that and then I'm going to explain what happened because this is always comical and if you understand it, it'll help you understand other things where this comes up. When using pip to first install python-docx, be sure to install python-docx, not docx. The installation name docx is for a different module that this book does not cover. However, when you're going to import the python-docx module, you'll need to run import docx not import dash python docx. So far, whenever I have a module I don't need, I just jump to the command line and I type in pip install module name. Here, 
there's a mismatch between the module I'm trying to install and the module name that I'm going to import into my program. Why is that? The reason is that these online repository and these module names are different. They're not always going to be the same. And I'll tell you the reason why. Let's say you create, come out with a great new language, right? And in your great new language, you create a repository where everyone can go dump their code. And some idiot, the first week you create that language, releases a module called docx, which is a name that everyone is going to be searching for and wants to use, right? And he produces crap code that is quickly outdated, not useful. Now, 10 years later, your language is everywhere, and this idiot still has locked up docx, right? And everyone wants to use a docx parser. That guy is like, no, I have clients out there that are using my crap code called docx. I'm not going to let you use it because, you know, that's the way it works. How are you going to resolve that? You're going to have to give your module a different name for pip. So in this case, what we did is they created python dash docx to install, and then you import with docx. So that's the difference there. And that can get kind of confusing, but oftentimes it's, it's because of like internal drama, right? So it's this difference between your module name, which has to be unique in your program, and the package name, which has to be unique on the archive, the repository. So uh, yeah, and, and oftentimes what happens is like, let's say you take your code, right? You have docx or let's use someone else. Jared creates docx. Right, Jared code is horrible and I hate it. And I'm like, Jared, I have a great idea. I'm gonna fix your code. And I spent 10 hours writing fixes for Jared's crap code. Now I wanna give back and Jared is like, nope, I don't want your changes. You're doing something different. Well, now what am I gonna do? I have all my code using Jared's module name, docx. And Jared says, I'm not going to accept your changes. Now we have diverging paths of development. I'm gonna do my thing, Jared's gonna do his thing. Both of our code bases are going to use the name docx, and we're going to upload both of them to the repository with different names. So all of these things play, this is what happens behind the scene. So you always made it a point on code quality, but sometimes it's not even code quality. Somebody can release out there their database object correction extension and decide that docx is the best name to release it under. And so sometimes you even get names that don't directly address what you think they're addressing. Some repositories, very few of them, but some repositories will actually tag who is the providing entity. And that'll help you sort it out. But a lot of repositories don't. Let's take a look at some things for fun. Hi, hi. Python dash Okay. So here's the two in question if we don't want to speculate anymore. All right. uh, Python dash docx is a Python library for creating and updating Microsoft Word docx files. You can see here that this file, this is one of the things that I always look for when I'm looking at a module. You see the release history? You see where it says 2019, 0101 or 0108, whatever? That tells me that this is, up, this is maintained. This got an update this year. That generally means Evan's happy. The PDF module last got an update in like 2004, right? We were looking at that on PDF thing and it was, we, we're using PyPDF2. So we come over here and this is PyPDF2. And this one, this one is so old, the update date isn't even tracked by last release. There you go, 2016. Okay, so it's not actually as old as I thought. It was last released on 2016. I always like to check that. So docx, the module we're not using, was released on 2014. And this one, python-docx, is released on 2019. So python-docx is likely an updated version of the original docx with five years more of development, right? This one seems to be dead, and then the one we're using is new. Okay. So here you go. Uh, this will work with Word, Libre Writer, Office, Open Office Writer, or whatever the crap. You know, there's a lot of different things it'll work with. And they're showing you how this works. 
Compared to plain text, docx's have a lot of different structure because they're actually XML, right? I don't know if it tells you that here, but it should. The document object contains a list of paragraph objects that represent the entire, uh, the entire, oh, that represent, where did I just stop reading? Paragraph objects for the paragraphs in the document. A new paragraph begins whenever the user presses enter or return, blah, blah, blah. So there's different ways of marking these things up. There's different runs with each different style. And here's how we do it. Let's go ahead and go back to our console. Actually, well, let's not. Let's see if I even want to do a demo with this, because I don't really care. Import docx, right? So we install Python dash docx. We type in import docx. We create a new document object, right? So here's we're doing this. We're saying docx document, and we're giving it the file name. Now, what's different about this and about the PDF reader? Did anyone catch the differences here? Aha, but there's one more thing. What there, that's, that's, that is what I'm talking about, but make one you're not, use, you're not using Python's open. You're boom, using. boom, we're not using Python's open, exactly. Well done, right? So this module is actually wrapping Python's open. That means they do it for you. I actually prefer the other method, where you make it very visible that you're using Python's not open. So in this method, they do it for you. You're just providing it the file name. You're not giving it any modes or anything. So uh, then you, you're providing length, right, on doc.paragraphs. This is going to tell you how many paragraphs you have in that file. You can actually get the text of a paragraph, docs.paragraph0.txt. I don't know if they have a picture here of the, the one that they're working with, this demo.ocx thing, demo.docx. Uh, let's see here. Hold on, I'm going to try to do something with Mac so everyone can laugh at me. Uh, open. Demo, is that going to work? Is that how this, this Mac shit works? Docx. What is that going to do? There we go. It's probably going to ask me to create an Apple account or some shit. No. Okay. So this is the demo, the, the demo document we're using. They didn't attach a screenshot, so this may help out. What is this? Go away. Okay. We have document title up here at the top. Then we have a paragraph here. Then we have a heading. We have an intense quote, first item and, and first item in the ordered list. So an ordered list and ordered list. So when we do paragraph zero dot text, we get the document title. The top thing is a paragraph according to the actual underlying format. Even if it doesn't look like that in English, you can think of a paragraph as like a section, right? Titles are paragraphs too. The next section says this, a plain paragraph with some bold text and italic. That's right here, that's a paragraph. Right? Uh, paragraph one dot runs. I don't even know what that does. But we go here, paragraph one dot runs. And it says four. That a run is a so styling a section. Book. Yeah, right? So this is the first run. That's the first style. This is the second style. This is the third style. And this is the fourth style. So each one of those are different styling components. <coughs> So you can start to see this is how the format works under the hood. When you hit the bold button, right, you create an additional run. Okay. So uh, and then you can see there, one run, two runs, three runs, four runs. Okay, so now we know how to parse it out. Getting the full text from a doc file. How do we do that? <laughs> well, we know here how we're going to get the runs. This is how we do the runs. We can, get, we can get all the different paragraphs by using docs.paragraphs. We can figure out how many we have with length. We can get all of the different runs, again, with length, because you could just do this in length, right? If you do length of doc.paragraph1.runs, what do we get? Four, right? We get four. So that's what we would have. Getting the full text from the doc file. Get text file name, we provide the file name here, not using Python's open. We say full text equals an empty array, and we say for para in docs.paragraphs. This is one way to do it. Remember, we can loop this way too. So one way we could have done this is we could have said for paragraph number in length of docs.paragraphs, and then always use paragraph in the number. We can just do this and cut that process out. Then we're doing full text, which is this empty array up here, dot append, 
para.text. That's going to add all of the text of the paragraph, right? And then what we're going to do is now we have an array where each different element in that array is the text of a paragraph. But we want to get all of the text in one string. How do we do that? Well, we simply join them all with a new line. Right, now we have one string, and that's what we return. <clears throat> and here's how it works. Import redox, print redox.getText, demo.docs, and then there you go. There's your text from that document. You parsed it. Full text.append. Uh, when we append it, we notice here, right, what they're trying to show you is, let's modify the string before returning it. So when we append up here, full text.append, and we say error text, right, we do not add a space from one paragraph to the next paragraph. We can do that, though, by just manually putting in the space in the concatenation, which is a really boring point, but whatever. To add a double space in between the paragraphs, change the join call to look like this. So where we have up here, one new line, that could actually be two. You can join with multiple characters. Nothing, nothing new or special. When you look here, the styling, they're showing you how the styling is determined, the view styles menu. This shows you all of the different styles of your, your document. You can do different things with that too. So you can see here the string files for all of the, how they look. Normal, heading one, heading five, list bullet, list paragraph. All of these are just different styles, right? He just has a list, an unordered list of those styles. When setting the style attribute, do not use spaces in the style name. For example, the style name may be, of subtle, uh, may be subtle emphasis, right? You should set the style to subtle emphasis one word. So what we're doing here is we're going to be looking at the styles internally of the document. <coughs> and we have this style that shows up in the GUI, in the GUI called subtle emphasis. We can add that style to the actual document by using one word, subtle emphasis. So somewhere we're going to set style to this, and it's going to be the same as if we had selected the text and hit this button. OK, so let's see here what we're doing. Creating Word de do documents with non-default styles. They're showing you how this all works. You can create new styles. You can add new styling shit. Everyone knows how to work this. It's just Microsoft Word, nothing special. If you don't know how to work it, that sucks. Uh, there's no real point in parsing docx, and I'm not teaching Microsoft Word. Runs can be further styled using the text attributes. Each attribute can be set to three values, true, false, or none, right? So when we talked about this before, we showed it right up here. We're doing these runs. There's three options for the style of that run. It can be styled, true. It can be unstyled, false. Or you can set that to none, which apparently does something else. Defaults to whatever the run style is set to. OK. List the attributes. There you go. Bold, italic, underline, strike. Double strike, all caps. These are all different uh, attributes, <coughs> text attributes. So let's see how we tie this whole thing together. OK. Docx.document. We're giving it a document name. We say doc.paragraph0.text. We get the text. Here, when we say doc.paragraph0.style, we get title. Title matches that thing in that GUI where we had that drop down, you know, and we could select all the different ones. We can just change it from title to normal. Now what happens if we change it to normal? Let's come over here to this. Boom. If we change this to normal, it's going to look like this. Right? So that's what we're doing. We're changing that style. So we set the style to normal. Now we look at docs.paragraphs1.text. That's the thing right below it. What are we going to do here? Well, we're going to look at all of the different runs. And here are all of the different runs. A plain paragraph with some bold and some italic. Right? All of these things with the different styles attached to them. We're going to say docs.paragraphs1.run style quote care. We're changing each one. We're going to change the style of the first run here to quote car, which is probably going to make it what we call uh, monospaced. Right? That means that every character is going to take up the same amount of space. 
We're going to underline the second run, so bold is going to get underlined. Th the third run, we're also going to underline. So zero, one, two, three. So bold and italic get underlined, and this gets quote card, whatever the hell that means. But my guess about it being monospace is probably right. Doc.save, restyle.docx. So then we're going to save it. And here we go. And I was actually wrong. Quote care in Word means we italicize it, right? So I guess that's how you show quotes by default. Okay, so you see what happened? This gets underlined, this got underlined, and then this got italicized. So look here, this is not italicized in this one. See how it's not italicized? Can I make that bigger? I don't know what in the... How do we view it bigger? View? Aha, this is why I hate Apple. Everything in Linux, zooming is plus, right? And Apple, plus is now changing the size of the, the thing. And to zoom in, you're using greater than sign. Great. You're saying every application in Linux? Zoom is always whatever, uh, you're talking control about plus. Line, control, right? shift plus. Uh, control, control shift plus. Control shift plus, yes, control it's shift plus. A, it's a convention. It's a convention. But everyone pretends like the OSX conventions are the same everywhere and it's easy to use. The reality is they're not. They're just, that's what people are used to saying. So here, to zoom in, you're hitting Apple greater than sign. So we figured it out. It's not difficult, but yeah, you have to always figure it out. Uh, so what we're doing here is uh, you, you import the docs and now we, we're seeing that we're gonna change some of this stuff. So what are we changing? We're changing this. This has got italicized. It's not italicized in the first one. And bold and italics got underlined. Bold and italic are ununderlined there. That's all that changed. And we did that with this stuff. And then we save it as this restylized. Now, if we don't want to save it as a new document, right, which we just did here, doc.save, what, what else can we do? We can come over here. We can add a new paragraph to it. And we can save it as hello world, right? I guess we did save it as another new document. I don't even know what the author is doing with this. He starts off this one with writing word documents, and he's showing us doc.save, but we already used doc.save up here. But I guess we're now adding paragraphs, so that seems like a better name for the section. So now what we're doing is we're adding paragraphs. We didn't previously have that. We iterated through paragraphs, but we didn't create our own. Creating our own is pretty simple. Doc.add paragraph, and you give it your paragraph. right? And then it shows it right there. That's what it looks like when you create your own paragraph. What else can we do? Let's add something with more paragraphs. So now we have doc.add paragraph hello world. We have a second one. This is your second paragraph. A third one. This is your third paragraph. And then we add a run. This text is being added in the second paragraph. So notice here, doc.object1, this is the second paragraph. Down here, we're adding more text to it. That's slightly confusing. I would argue that this should have been above para object two. So you should finish the first paragraph before you create the second. But we create the first paragraph, we create the second paragraph, and then we change the first paragraph. And when we save it, what do we get here? Hello world, this is the second paragraph. This text is being added to the second paragraph. This is yet another paragraph, which is the third. Headings, not much more complex. So here we have, uh, we create a new document, we have add headings. Header zero, header one, two, three, four. These are all just boilerplate stuff. And we're giving them different sizes, zero, one, two, three, four. Generally speaking, this tends to be how most things work. Uh, the higher that number, the heading number, <clears throat> the smaller the font. You see this in HTML too, right? You see this in HTML as well. There we go. Most people think I'm talking about HTML too, which is really old. You see this in HTML as well. When you want to create a really big ass heading, what do you use? Any HTML gurus here? Kenya, you know HTML. H1. H1. Use H1, right? H1 is big heading. H2 smaller, H3 smaller. That's what we're seeing here again. Remember, everything that we've done today is a markup language. Postscript, Word, they all have a lot of commonalities. It becomes easier as you learn it. So header 0, header 1, header 2, header 3, header 4, and so on and so forth. Nothing cool. Adding line breaks and page breaks, also nothing different. 
we're just exploring the API. These are all, they all work the same way, right? So adding a line break and a page break, how do we do it? When we get to the run and we want to add the break, right, we have our run here. You could save this to a special variable. You could say, you know, my first run, add break. Call the add break method on any run, right? And you can give it whatever kind of break you want. There's this thing called docx.txt wd page break. That's a page break. There are other kind of breaks for a Word document. You have paragraph breaks and section breaks and all of that other kind of crap. You just have to look up what kind of breaks Word documents have and how the library supports them, if you care. Then doc.save, you create the second page. Right? So you create a new document, add, two add a paragraph to it, add a break after it, add another paragraph, and then we say we're going to save it as two-page doc. So it's actually one document with two pages inside of it. And then adding pictures. This is the last piece. How do we add pictures? We give it zofi.png, which is the name of the picture that we're adding. And then we call with it with doc. We need to have the width of that image. And we say here docx.shared inches one. Right? So we're adding zofi.png. We need the, when I said the width of that image, I don't mean the width of that image as it sits on the disk in pixels. I mean the width of that image that you want rendered in the document, right? So that's what the width is. And then the height of that image you want rendered in the document. And then of course, it just gives you the doc object back and it's got the image in it now. And that's it. Okay, a string value of the PDF file name is not passed to the PDF pi reader function. What do you pass this function instead? I said there's two names for it. One of them is Python and one of them is the rest of the world. File object slash handle. That's right, file object slash handle. What modes do the file objects for the PDF reader and PDF writer need to be opened in? Or reader, writer, reader, writer, WB. RB or WB. You're either reading or writing, and in both of them, if you're using PDFs, you're using bytes. Because there's two ways a file can be opened. One of them is text, which is the default, T. I think it actually takes a T. The other one is bytes, which is for binary objects. MP3s, waves, PDFs, all that kind of crap. That's different. If you open it in Notepad and go, shit, this is totally useless, you need bytes. OK. How do you acquire a page object for about this book from a PDF reader object? What do you do? Who remembers? You call dot get page. That's it. What uh, PDF file reader variable stores the number of pages in a PDF document? What? Num pages. Sounds right. I don't actually remember, but she's got it. Okay. Uh, a PDF reader ob file reader object is encrypted with the password swordfish. What must you do before you can obtain objects from it? They send you something encrypted. You have to decrypt it. How do you decrypt the object? Dot decrypt. Dot decrypt. It's that simple with swordfish. Uh, actually, is it that simple? Dot decrypt. Yes, it's that simple. Okay. What method do you use to rotate pages? Dot rotate page, something like that. Dot rotate Point, clockwise. Dot rotate clockwise. <coughs> it doesn't doesn't actually matter. I, I have never had to rotate PDF pages. You probably never will have to do that. This is a very useless question. If you need to rotate a page, read the documentation for whatever library you're using. We're teaching today with a library that's not even maintained. Yes. Photocopy or scan apps. There you go, yeah. People, Use people will put a paper down, the photocopier will typically scan it into a PDF file and send it to you. If they put this paper down, not correctly aligned, then they will scan the page horizontally instead of top to bottom or whatever. I agree. Yeah. The, the, some people do have to rotate PDFs. I'm just telling you, I've never had to do it. What's up? It being upside down. Yeah, sure. I mean, I do it all the time in my applications, but I've never said I have 5,000 PDFs rotated the wrong way. Let me fix them all with Python. 
you know. I'm just, that's just me. Now, I, I kind of pulled out the one, the shocker here, right? I said I have screwed with watermarking PDFs and removing watermarking from PDFs professionally. Uh, so this stuff is handy, just I don't have not used it all. Okay. Uh, what methods return a document object for a file? And, and did the guy that worked for the district clerk, did he really work for the district clerk, by the way? Yes. He did. He had an idea. That's awesome. <laughs> He's probably like, yeah, that's illegal. No. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I almost thought he was trolling me. Because here I was telling him all about how I use this professionally, and I scammed the district clerk. And he's like, I work for the district clerk. And I was like, you've got to be shitting me. Like, what is the chances of that? It's a government office. Didn't the Republicans fire everyone yet? Come on. You know, he actually did work for the district clerk, though. It was uh, kind of depressing. Uh, I'm sure the statute of limitations is out. So 2006, right? Yeah, it was only 2006 that I did it. Uh, yeah, I got a lot of funny stories about getting sued. Uh, what messages do you use to rotate a page? We talked about that. What method returns a document object for a file named demo.docx? I would actually gladly accept it doesn't matter if I have that problem, I'll read the documentation, but we can look it up. So here's what we got. Uh, we did it right up here. It's, it's, th this is like, it's right here. Uh, docx document. Yeah, docx. Doc, is it, but is it, what, it's, there's like a one with a, con, a name to it, right? There you go. You pass the file name into it. Okay, docx. document. There you go. Ed gets one point. Ed's ready to manipulate docx files in Python. Uh, what is the difference between a paragraph object and a run object? Paragraph is a container of runs, right? We went through that. We should know that one. Because that's, that's actually the most important question so far, because it actually tells you something about how docs are actually stored, regardless of the language. OK. And how they're styled internally, the words. How do you obtain a list of paragraph objects for a document object that's stored in a variable named docs? How do you obtain a list of paragraph objects for a document object that's stored in a variable named docs? Well, we know that when we call doc.paragraphs, we can iterate over it. So if you simply provide that to list, you'll have a list of it. It's that simple. Let's show you here where we did it. We said the whole for each para in paragraph thing, right? For para, right here, in doc.paragraphs. Whenever you can do this, you can wrap this in a list and get a list of them. That'll also work. So there's your answer. OK. Uh, what type of object has bold, underline, italic, strike, and underline variables? A run. The run, right? What is the difference between setting the bold variable to true, false, or none? The difference between setting the bold variable to true, false, or none, if it is true, you have enabled that type of style. It is bold or underlined or whatever the hell else. If it is false, it doesn't show styled at all. And if it is none, it inherits the default style of the parent. Right? So you have a parent run, which can be styled. If you say none, on the, 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 if you have a paragraph, which can be styled, if you say none, you inherit the style of the paragraph. If you say false, it's unstyled, like you did control shift V if you're on a sane non op Mac OS operating system. And if you do uh, true to any of those, you enable those styles. OK. How do you create a document object for a new Word document? You don't give it a name, right? You call whatever, dot document and with a name, and you can create, but it, you give it a name. That a, I don't know. You give it a name of something that doesn't exist. What's the deal here? Dun, dun, dun. You create a document that doesn't has no name, and then when you want to save it, you save it with a name right there. So that's how you do it. By the way, again, this is totally 100% arbitrary, which is why it all comes down to the library. And you should not memorize any of these things here because it's all totally arbitrary. I want to stress that. Memorizing will make you retarded. Don't do it. 
Some libraries, right, let me give you a case in point. Some libraries where you see up here docx.document, right, we can imagine a library where we give it a name, right, and if the file doesn't exist, it just creates it for you. And then you can write to that object. And when you call save, you don't have to provide the name because you gave it to the constructor. It finishes it, flushes it, and writes it to disk. You can write thousands of different methods of doing this. Just consult the, the documentation. This is how this one's doing it. OK. Moving on. How do you add a paragraph with the word hello text? So document object stored in a variable named doc. Doc dot add underscore paragraph. Beautiful. I get that one. I paid attention to myself talking. It's difficult sometimes. <laughs> what integers represent the level of headings available in a Word document? Zero through five. Isn't it five? I think it's five in this one. I think we did a fifth one. Nope, zero through four. Zero, one, two, three, four. There's five different types of headers, but we're zero based. Unlike in HTML, where we're one based. OK, because there's no H0. What did you do? We already did that. We're done. Good job. Uh, yeah, we have PDF paranoia. Does anyone want to cover this? Well, let's do it. I, I guess we want to. Let's, let's talk about it. Using OS.walk functions from chapter 9, write a shell, a script that will go through every PDF in a folder and its subfolders and encrypt the PDFs using a password. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take PDFs, we're going to encrypt them to underscore encrypted.pdf, suffix added as the original file name before deleting the original file, right? Have the program attempt to read and decrypt the file to ensure that, what was, that it was encrypted correctly. Then write a program that finds all encrypted PDFs in a folder and its subfolder and creates a decrypted PDF of the PDF using provided password. Is, the, is this just shits and giggles? Oh, these are just like custom examples, practice projects. There we go. Yeah, what I would do is, do they explain these things here? Let's take a look at this because I'm not going to live code that. <coughs> Aha, we do have it. No? I don't think so. This is combined. It's not encrypted. Yes, they did, they did not actually do it. Right? In order to do this, what you'd probably have to do is have either memorized how OS walk works, or you'd have to look it up in the docs. That we can do. OS.walk was the function that essentially, when you give it uh, to Python, what it's going to do is it's going to take care of all of that directory traversal business, where if you have lots of directories that go deep, right? OS.walk takes a function and it's going to call it on every directory it finds with all of the files in that directory. That's what I remember, right? So as a programmer, when I have a problem and I say I need to have, I have directories and directories and directories, I remember that directory walk takes a function and it's going to return to me one time for every directory it finds with all of the files in that directory, right? Uh, Python import os help os.walk. And we can read it. Do, do, do. But I'm not actually going to live code the rest of it. So, what is that? I'm not going to live code any of it. I just wanted to go over that. If anyone wants to hit it up. Oh, I don't want to keep that talking up. There you go. And we covered this in a, in a prior example. This is also really helpful. At the bottom of a lot of these, there's examples on it. If you want to cover it, that's how it works again. You can see that we're going to get the root, the dirs, and the files for each different directory. 